Welcome to the Creative Play and Podcast Network. Join us as we review our favorite RPGs, collectible card games, MMOs, video games, PC games, and bring up interesting topics and things that we'd like to share with everyone. Sit back and enjoy the show. Hi, this is Kelly, a.k.a. Trixie from Ragnarok and Roll, a sign to Ragnarok story, and Tilda Wimblewick from D&D Journey of the Fifth Edition. First off, I would just like to say thank you to everyone for listening to our varied adventures, as well as for rating us on iTunes and RPGpodcast.com. If you haven't rated us yet, we would greatly appreciate it if you could. And if you're looking for more ways to support our efforts, we are now on Patreon, a great site where you can help us continue making more podcasts, as well as some special surprises for our patrons. If you can, please look us up at www.patreon.com slash cppn. Every little bit helps. And again, thank you for listening. Hey guys, Jim here from Creative Plan Podcast Network. Just want to send a big shout out and hi to you guys. This week is going to be our special Tuscan 42 week because we spent an amazing weekend last weekend. Hanging out with a bunch of our friends, enjoying the con, just relaxing. Good time had by all. And I just wanted to make sure to share as much as I can. And just to let you know, we have listened to your requests. We do now have a Twitter at Creative, capital P, capital P, N-E-T. So that's Creative PP Net. We now have a YouTube channel, which we just made up and put some videos that we recorded at the convention. That's going to be for YouTube. It's going to be look up Creative Play and Podcast Network. We come right there as the channel. If you like it, hit subscribe like some of the videos. We've got some really interesting stuff there. If you are of the adult persuasion, I would definitely say check out the Tippy T part one. You get to see some adults having some adult fun, having some tea dueling, and just general blast of a good time. And also, there's a big tip there. Tuscon 43 next year, we're going to actually get to see George R. R. Martin in person. He's going to be down here in Tucson. So if you guys are a fan of his books, and quite a few of you are, or his TV show, come on down to Tuscon 23. It's going to be amazing next year, pretty much around the same time. They always host it around October 31st. Come on down. We can meet in person. By all means, if you want, we can hang out, and we can see George R. R. Martin together. And for the Halloween costume contest, we've actually got some video of the winners for this year. And I'm definitely thinking next year's costume contest is going to be filled with White Walkers. And maybe Jon Snow. But definitely lots of White Walkers. So I'm going to go ahead and throw some of the panels that we've listened to. And by all means, hit us up. Hit us up on Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter. All on Creative Plan Podcast Network. And we'd love to talk to you. And here's the show. Good morning, happy people. Good morning. Good morning. The doors will be locking in 90 seconds. Welcome to the murder dome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anybody else want one? I'm good. Got it. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <clears throat> what are you staring at, darling? I'm an extra person. We, we do have an extra person. Who's the extra person? No, it's we not me. I'm not I'm, I'm scheduled for it. We have acquired <laughs> Eric Flint. Uh, hey. Yay. Awesome. That's a good thing Eric. to do. Oh, one, is. two, three, four. No, there's five on all of them. Well, actually, we're all here. All right. So, <laughs> <laughs> Eric Flint from 16.32. Do we have a moderator? Nope. Nope. Not it. 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 Congratulations, oh, Mod. Oh, <laughs> I do enough of the moderating stuff for my wild west guy. Because he doesn't have to see. Yeah, I, I will be what passes for a moderator. Yay! Which means we will start now. So everyone quiet now. Um, I will do the usual introduction thing, but everybody, you know, keep it brief. Uh, so start here and go down and explain why you're qualified to speak on a panel entitled, I Will Kill You. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is James Breen. Uh, I'm local here in Tucson, owner of Dreadnought Radio. Uh, 
do a little bit of short story writing. Recently, I've been doing more radio plays, and I just love coming up with ways to kill people who I think would just irritate the hell out of my characters. So, <laughs> my name's Eric Flint. I have, as of right now, I have published it's either 49 or 50 novels. I'm not sure which. And of those 49 or 50 novels, there is exactly one in which I didn't kill anyone. <laughs> was it a murder mystery? <laughs> uh, it was a science fiction, hard SF adventure, and the gag there was, for those of you familiar with Bane books, it's been a running gag for years of authors killing off Joe Buckley. Joe oh. Buckley is a real fan, he lives in Boston, and the, the tradition got started many years ago. I have killed off Joe Buckley twice <laughs> in gruesome ways, and the gag in this novel was that we kept Joe Buckley alive through four <laughs> catastrophic accidents. <laughs> <laughs> but to keep the spirit of the story proper, we didn't kill anybody else off. You know, 40 years from now, there are going to be panels at Worldcon <laughs> arguing about this our, our typical trickster figure named Joe Buckley that everyone's going to be Who was he? Uh, I'm Shannon McGuire. I am the official CIFWA stabber. It is a, an appointed position. I was appointed by John Scalzi. The only way that you can take that position in my badge for me is to meet me in the murder dome. <laughs> you want to do that. And I like killing people. <laughs> Hi, I'm Weston Oaks. Um, I've written 26 books, and uh, Billy Pickett has been killed in every single one of them. <laughs> For those of you who want to know who Billy Pickett is, he's a guy who beat me up when I was in fifth grade. <laughs> <laughs> that, that fucker was six feet tall, and I was just a regular fifth grader. <laughs> so I wasn't able to get back at him then, but I've been killing him off in new and efficient ways. Uh, hi, I'm Yvonne Navarro. I've written 20 something books. Um, been killing people in every one of them with monsters and supernatural and all kinds of fun stuff. And uh, um, the pharmacist who dumped me, his name was Howard, and I killed him in my very first novel. Um, but I, at first I made him really like ginormously fat and ugly and <laughs> unlikable, um, just to really dig it in. <laughs> There's nothing psychologically wrong with us. <laughs> <laughs> The title of the panel, uh, and as a scrupulous moderator, I'll see to it we stick to it. There will be no panel drip here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no panel uh, drip. I think there has been exactly one panel in the history of science fiction fandom that did not wander off topic. But there is at least a rumor that wasn't that existed. the panel about panel drip. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 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 So anyway, the title of this one is My Favorite Way to Kill Off Characters. So we will, starting from that end, please explain what your favorite way is of killing off a character and why. Um, I think I like to burn them alive. You know, it's just because it's, it's so fast. <coughs> and because I had an angel do it to a bad, an evil shame once. And she just basically embraced him and, and just burned him alive and it was it was medium fast and it was kind of smelly and smoky. It was good. <laughs> <laughs> so first you flay the skin. <laughs> then you drag them on gravel. Uh, behind the slow moving talk. <laughs> That's wow. I like diseases. <laughs> <laughs> no. I know, right? No one is surprised. And the nice thing about that is, is it's the gift that keeps on giving, right? <laughs> like, you can all run away from a fire while you've taken the disease with you. And you can only really drag one person at a time behind a normal-sized car, three if you've got a big haul trucker. But I can infect the entirety of Disney World <laughs> with immunodepressant smallpox in, like, six minutes. <laughs> we got this thing out for Disney World. Oh, I love Disney World. It's one of my favorite places in the world. But holy shit, bears! That is where the, the immune like we're all gonna die. Disney World is where it begins. Because in July in Disney World, everyone flies.
flocks all the time to these misters that they have set up in front of various uh, places. All of the misters draw their water from the same Disney-controlled reservoir. The Disney-controlled reservoir can be accessed through the back road that runs between the <laughs> <laughs> I don't think somebody thought this out. There's a gate. <laughs> to get to the gate, you have to turn left as you're heading down the access road toward Epcot. When you reach the gate, it's November now, so the current passcode. Is <laughs> 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 yes, exactly. Like it is so easy to do. It's not quite as easy as getting to the snake pit, but it's, Disney has their own on-property snake pit. <gasps> <laughs> I got to go to the snake pit and the, it was amazing. And so yeah, Disney World is like, I can destroy humanity if you just give me 15 minutes and a small vial. <laughs> and, we're, and we're concerned about people getting on planes. <laughs> Well, as you're between me and her, I'm good. Circle, circle, dot, dot, dot. Now you've got your cootie shot. I, uh, ironically, I don't actually particularly enjoy killing characters. Uh, oh, no, I know. Yeah. Um, um, I have a very low body count of major characters. Um, I'm actually really in those same 49 or 50 books, I've only killed less than a handful. Um, although I still get fans mad at me for every single one of them. Um, <laughs> fans will always tell you, you got to kill off major characters. Yeah, yeah, but then you do it, and, uh, and they didn't forgive you for it. Um, well, what, that's because you killed off their favorite characters. Well, my problem is specific. I, my, because of the kind of books I write, a lot of them have major battle scenes in it. And that means I've got to figure out the battle scenes. And, and, my wife can always tell because you say, oh, you're grouchy. You've got to write another battle scene. You? <laughs> and it's because you've got to figure out a way to kill off a whole bunch of people. And it's got to be different from every other way you've done it. And it's kind of tricky to do it. Um, and what I find is what I'm really most looking for is a certain emotional impact, not the exact actual way of killing someone off. What's going to determine what I do is the second time I killed Joe Buckley, I killed him in one novel, 1632 series, rather heroically. He's fighting against a maniac and he gets, you know, strangled. <coughs> the second time, I want to kill off Joe Buckley in the same series. This is tricky. So the second <laughs> Joe Buckley was a highwayman, but just because I wanted to give Joe a hard time, because he is a friend of mine. I had him be a notorious highwayman who got drunk and fell off the pier and drowned in the Thames. Very <laughs> So that that's part of a joke because the cover of that book is it, it, it's a it's a takeoff of the anatomy lesson by Rembrandt and the corpse is Joe Buckley. He said a photograph of himself lying flat to the artist, so the artist could draw him. And all the characters in the cover illustration are different Bane authors who have killed off Joe Buckley. One of the <laughs> can, can I pause very brief panel drift? <laughs> Why the hell is Bane killing Joe Buckley? Like, what happened? Did there he, are different, there was a bet. There are different... There are different stories as to how it got started. One story is that he beat David Weber in a game of spades and David never forgave him. Another story, which David claims is a real one, is that Joe Buckley caught him in an error in one of his novels and in retaliation, David Weber killed him. Off. <laughs> However it got started, it then just became a running joke. So John Ringo decided to kill him off and he did it several different ways. And then it just, one author after another started doing it. That's fantastic. And it just became a kind of house <laughs> custom. And if you're going to be an established paid author, you've got to kill off Joe Buckley sooner or later. And so I killed him off in two stories. And then, like I said, Reich and I kept him alive through a whole trilogy. <laughs> um, and it's just a joke. I mean, it's, just, it's literally a house gag, but, 
Bain has it. Bain is the only publisher that really has its own fan base that hangs around and discusses. So they're all in on it. And fortunately, Joe himself is. A He's from Boston. He's got a real thick Boston accent. He's in on the joke. So he plays part of it. It's just a lot of fun. That's, that's great. Yeah, it is. Sorry for the yeah. panel drift. I just really <laughs> wanted to know. You kept bringing it up. Yeah, no, so that's how that happens. So you have to give some thought to how you're going to kill off Joe Buckley. It's usually done very, very gruesome. This is the uh, Joe Buckley panel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we should get I, you in, in other, yes, I've done, what I'm usually trying to do is figure out a way that's going to dramatically heighten the scene. So the specific way the character dies, I don't know how to put this. I'm not looking so much for the way they die. As for One of my favorite ones, for instance, to give you an idea, is I've got a battle scene in which the general is talking to his aide because he's losing control of the battle and he really wants the aide to do something and the aide gets shot in the head. And the general starts cursing him because he got killed, goddammit, and now he can't do what he wants him to do. It's that kind of thing. You just figure out something that makes it striking. What's hard to do, honestly, is not make it... There's only so many ways you can kill somebody. Honestly, and I know... If you're just thinking of casual <laughs> homicide, it doesn't occur to you, but when you're killing people off wholesale, which is what authors tend to do, you have to start thinking of how many different ways can I bump somebody off because your fucking fans will follow this. <laughs> they will catch you if you just file off the serial numbers and they will give you a hard time about it. Anyway. All right. uh, me. I like to do it in one of two ways. Number one, make them walk the plank at 20,000 feet. Tends to do the job pretty well. But if it's someone who's really just irritated and pissed off one of my characters, it's torture. Uh, I had one where, you know, guy and sister had been murdered, caught the murderer, spent two weeks drilling tiny holes into his kneecaps and into the joints and his fingers, and then eventually <laughs> dosed him with a bunch of LSD, threw him in a coffin and buried him alive. <laughs> <laughs> So the uh, exotic torture is probably my favorite. You know, the, the walk the plank at 20,000 feet, that's just expedient. <laughs> I, I will say, though, I need the deaths in my fiction and in other people's fiction to fit the setting and not violate the rules of the universe. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, have you seen Jurassic World? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so Jurassic World is the fourth movie in this franchise. Uh, there was also a cartoon, which had a surprisingly high body count for being on Saturday mornings at 8.30 a.m. Um, and, you know, the two books, obviously, that it was based on. People have died in every single work of Jurassic Park fiction. That is part and parcel of having a theme park filled with dinosaurs. The only death that has actually made me uncomfortable enough to break me out of the story, to take me away from being a Jurassic Park, was Zara the babysitter in Jurassic World. She's picked up by a pterodon, dropped into the Mosasaur pit, pushed under and pulled out of the water repeatedly. She's essentially waterboarded by a dinosaur, which is not what I signed up for. And then eaten alive by the Mosasaur. Is she actually eaten by the Mosasaur? I couldn't tell. She is yeah, actually she eaten by the Mosasaur. The, she was still she hanging from the pterodon. Yeah, yeah, and here's the thing, though. Every other death in the Jurassic Park franchise, even the deaths of the villains who are there to exploit the dinosaurs who have earned mm -hmm. a certain level of retribution, every other death has either been very quick mm -hmm. or primarily off screen. Even the big human bad guy for this particular movie, we see him reaching for the, the raptor and then we see the blood hit the wall. Okay, we right. don't dwell on it. Dara's death, Zara's death would not have bothered me in a horror movie. I watch a lot of horror movies. That is tame for the sort of thing that happens in a lot of the movies I watch. But it was so out of proportion for the Jurassic Park franchise and for what she had earned yeah, she had that done it. Yeah. It, it bothered me very viscerally. I remember the second time I saw the movie, first time I didn't really catch it. The second time, I couldn't quite see what happened, so I thought, well, maybe she didn't get killed. I couldn't quite, because it all happens, it does happen pretty fast. Yeah. And I thought, well, they must have had her survive, but then she never shows back up in the movie. The death that bothered me in the movie, and this is because I'm, it's, it's the reason that my wife often hates going to movies with me, is because I tend to be obsessive about does this plot make sense. Oh and the killing in 
Jurassic World that I emotionally enjoyed but really irritated me was when the Mosasaur leaps out of its tank and kills the monster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, it's great because the monster gets killed, and I'm partial to Mosasaurs because I made Mosasaurs a, an actual character in a movie, uh, in a book of mine. But would any theme park create a tank where a Mosasaur <laughs> <laughs> jump out and snap somebody up? I mean, why is it there a fucking you know, reeling? I have not thought of the lack of reeling. So, so it that bothered actually, me. No, that would bother me too. So we have one, one death that doesn't work with the plot. Logically, right. there should not have been an easy access for the Mosasaur. Well, and one death that doesn't work with the it franchise. It doesn't work. Dramatically, no. Yeah, if I'm if I'm reading one of your books and everyone that's died has been shot in the head because it's a bullet's war. It's very clean. It's a bullet's war. It's the reason I stopped reading Arthur uh, uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs' um, John Carter Mars book mm -hmm. is because I'm going to ruin these books for everybody. Yay! Now read them. Okay. <laughs> everybody always gets stabbed through the heart. Yeah. That's not easy to do. It's the only way anybody gets killed in a John Carter is he gets stabbed through the heart, and after four books, it drove me nuts. It's, it's not true. Huh? It's not true. Several died by suicide by jumping off of flying boats. Is that before oh, right, or right, after right, the end of book okay, four? Okay, all right, no, that's, all right. that's never a combat. That's a, right. Yeah, I'm thinking of combat. It's always stabbed through the heart. It's not, which is, by the way, not an easy way to kill no, somebody. No, it's, it's really hard to stab someone yeah, in the heart. It is. Right. You gotta go through the sternum. Nobody gets their head cut off. Nobody bleeds out. Nothing. It's always a stab through the heart. I'm fed up with it. Yeah. You were saying that it, that what the theme park would have the Mosasaurus to jump out of the pool. Yeah. This seems to be the standard um, engineering for Jurassic Park. Usually they get high. Okay, okay, no, wait a minute, no, wait a minute. You have a point, but in every, <laughs> but in every other instance, it's bad engineering that leads to something breaking down, or, 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 or apparently they don't have backup batteries. Yeah. <laughs> this is just the lack of a rail. <laughs> no. That's but not this is high. just literally, they're out on, on the plaza right next to the tank. I mean, that's where they are, and the Moses are just, oh, there's much. <laughs> the engineer realizes it's going to break anyway. They're so big, you put a rail up, it's going to crush yeah. it. Yeah. i got to admit, if they open Jurassic Park tomorrow, even with a million big signs saying warning, you will just die. Like, this is actually a population control measure. I would have purchased my ticket to the park. I, I just feel like I'm a hug me a velociraptor. Yeah. That's how I go. <laughs> the funny thing is, I actually like the movie, but it's, it's because the act, you know, I just found the acting was good and I enjoyed the characters. I mean, so I enjoyed this movie more than I did, not as much as I did the very first one, but more than I did the, the two middle ones. Um, you could pretty much take the two middle ones out of the franchise and the first yeah, one and the fourth yeah. one would be perfect yeah. by themselves. Yeah. yeah. I will fight you for Lost World. <laughs> <laughs> when you talk about killing off your friends, Well, you have to have their permission. Yeah. You know, I, mean, I, I do that quite often. It says at the beginning, all, all these names are fictional. It just so happens it's, it's your name that is fictional. I just do it out of the hat. So there's no problem. Well, no, there's never a legal show up problem. And say, what are you doing to my name? Well, no. first of all, I'm not worried about Billy Pickett because I don't think he ever graduated, so he can't read. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 one of his country bumpkin, you know, mountain people actually, you know, are able to read it to him, then I might have an issue. But you know, I've spent 30 years in the military. If I can't defend myself right now, then, then I'm in the wrong business. I, 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 I can actually tell you legally how it works, is that as long as you can't be accused of violating someone's privacy. Now, what this means is that if you name someone and then indicate where they live or something which yeah. would make it possible for someone else to locate that person, then you can be in legal trouble for violating someone's privacy unless they're a major corporation or someone who's already a celebrity who basically has tacitly given up their privacy anyway. Yeah. So I can write a novel in which I put General Motors in it and they can't sue me for violating their privacy. But if I wrote a novel that named my local taco stand in such a way I better have their permission because they claim, hey, I'm just a little local store and you just plaster me, you know, yeah. all over. Now, 
if you're going to kill somebody, nobody can copyright their name. You just can't do it because there are so many, there are only so many names, there are too many. So, you know, any character you kill off in a book, unless it's some name you completely invented, there's going to be somebody in the United States probably, or certainly in the world, who's got that name, and they still can't sue you. Now, this is different from what's called tuckerizing someone or redshirting them. I do this quite a bit. Um, I'm sure other authors do too. I know other authors do. I you must have done this, haven't you? Oh, I've sold a bunch of tuckerizations yeah, I sold for charity. Yeah, sold some charity. That's typically the way it happens, yeah. Uh, kind will have a charity and people will bid and if they pay cough up a hundred bucks, two hundred bucks, they get, you know, Shannon will kill them off in one of her novels or I will or somebody. <laughs> and then, of course, they want their name there. Yeah. And you've got witnesses that they've <laughs> for it, so they can't go forward. I have um, had a, held a couple of auctions where And they always came with a, a warning, um, you know, because this character is it's not going to be a good character. And one of our, our friends bought the name of uh, a really rotten, rotten kid in Highborn, um, and he won the auction. And I said, okay, well, well it's a female, you know, what do you, he's named after my daughter. <laughs> and I, saw, I said, Bob, are you sure? Because, you know, it's, this is not a Yeah, she's, I'm going to give it to her to read when she gets home. <laughs> 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 that, that does actually take us to one point, which is what, when you're writing, when you're talking writing with people, putting people in, consent is important mostly for the self-defense angle, whether it's a legal thing or not, being able to say, no, Yvonne gave me permission to do this. Um, but you never want to write in a fanish enemy. Like, Yvonne and I have a big fight right now because I, I hate your sweater and you hate my hair. Now ah, we're enemies now. If I then start killing off an Yvonne in every book I write, I'm going to look like a petty bitch. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that simple. And people are going to notice and they're going to say some stuff and I'm not really going to have a defense. So, you know, make sure that your villainous characters, if they're based on real people, are, are coming in either with consent or from a position very, very far from fandom. <laughs> and, and, and it's probably a good idea not to routinely kill off editors and publishers. <laughs> 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 exactly like your books play off. <clears throat> you know, you might eventually want to sell something to them. So I, I was curious about, you know, are there rules about killing off children and animals? And have you done it? And how you <laughs> 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 so, so for my Steel Team 666 series, Thomas Dunn put in the um, um, contract that I can kill as many people as many children as I want, but I can't kill the dog. He's in the contract, period. Wow. Can't do it. Now, personally, I wouldn't have killed the dog, and I might have heard it, but I would never hey. kill the dog. Well, you know, there has to be some, you know, some, some tension, you know. Um, not, not everybody lives. Just, that's what it works. But I do have a problem personally killing children. Now, when I killed four billion people in my last book, um, when the aliens invade the planet, that wasn't me, that was them, but um, still, I, <laughs> children, I don't like them. I still remember the start of Dead Cell. Of Dead Cell. Oh, oh God, yes. yes. Oh. I mean, that was the, it was almost physically painful for me to read that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People will take killing animals, like people, on the scale of what can you kill, I have had literally no one get mad at me for wiping out most of Europe. <laughs> no one cares. <laughs> I have had a couple of angry notes, of, of angry letters and angry interactions about killing kids, because I've killed some kids. You kill one dog. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit, there. Like, it's a zombie apocalypse that affects anything mammalian over 40 pounds. Golden Retrievers are basically a zombie infection delivery system. That's what they're for. I have gotten angry letters. I had one person report me to the SPCA because they're the eye of the animals. Um, I, I had people uh, come up to me at cons and say that they're going to teach me to love dogs because I clearly hate dogs. I, I remember the was one of the following movies where the, the zombie virus affected everything but not dogs. Remember that? Uh -huh. Oh yeah, that was um, <laughs> Dawn of the Dead. They had they sent the dog across the street to the yeah. gun yeah. 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 shop. I guess it was a remake. Yeah. Or something. It was a remake. But yeah, people are very unforgiving of, of killing animals. Um, 
I have one series that has talking intelligent mice that are basically people. Uh, that they're playing with mice. And I've killed one mouse, and holy crap, the hate mail I've received on killing one mouse. Like, it's, a, oh, yeah. it's a mouse. I cried too, but the, the, you can't just keep going into these horribly dangerous situations when you're this tall and have the self preservation instincts of a toaster and expect not to eventually die. Yeah. <laughs> that, William, do you have a I've only written one series that Dave, Web Dave Freer and I wrote. Books, uh, first book's called Rats, Bats, and Bats. And it's got oh, intelligent yeah. rats and bats, but nobody cares if we kill them off. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> even though I think they're really nifty. But it's yeah, it is funny what people will get sentimental about. Is there was a movie, The Professionals, I saw years ago, which I enjoyed, star Burt Lancaster. And he gets in an argument with another character who's upset over the fact that what they're planning to do is probably going to kill some horses. And, and he says, it's one of God's dumbest animals, and we're going to be killing a bunch of people at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> that people are I have never killed off named children that I can think of, or dogs. I mean, a lot of them get killed off just as part of, you know. The environment. Just, well, you know, there's... Bolide hits or something. Obviously, it's going to kill a lot of kids and animals. But I can't think of any story I've ever written. And the reason, in my case, is that's when my own sentimentality is just that. What's the dramatic point of developing a kid as a character in order to kill it off? I mean, or him or her off. It's just I can't. I've never had a story where it came off. I will forgive it with both kids and animals if it's logical. Yeah, uh, yeah. Again, the second Jurassic Park movie, you have that beautiful shot of the T-Rex standing up with the dog, with the chain hanging from his mouth and the dog house at the end. And having been in suburban areas where people chain their dogs to their dog house, I'm like, that is a beautiful warning about don't chain your damn dog. <laughs> <laughs> a T-Rex will come along and <laughs> and, and I am down for that. That actually made beautiful dramatic sense. It fit in the scene. It was not... It was funny, it was not gratuitous. Um, but if you just have your psycho killers stop hunting co-eds to go into the pet store and chop up some guinea pigs, I'm not so much with you. <laughs> well, yes. what about killing off uh, members of known organizations like ISIS or OMGs? Do you ever worry about that coming back? No. No, no. I really don't. Um, you know, first of all, I don't know anybody in ISIS, so, so you know, I'm not. I'm just making up names. So, but I, I'm, I'm really not concerned about because once, once again, they fall into the Billy Fisher category. I don't think they do. And if they do, they're certainly not reading what I write. I think you look like members of, of certain terrorist organizations reading that kind of American military, like hard mill SF. Just so that they could mock it, and I'm down with that because that's sales for you, and that's dog food for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is kind of a follow-up on something that came up in the, the recent discussion. Um, after you have killed a character, how, how do you feel about it? Do you kill them? Do you, do you feel you're crying, or are you sometimes happy, and you're like, I'm, you know, that my readers are gonna hate me for this, or this that was the best ending for that character? How do you feel? when you're writing it, and I'm sure it varies, but. Okay, it just goes there. back to a panel I was on earlier where it was on the subject of do you write plot-driven or character-driven, and the characters sort of take over, you know, and, and what I said was my characters work for me and they damn well do what they're told. Or <laughs> <laughs> fire. So typically when I kill off a character, that character had came sort of out of the out of the mole stamp, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you will eventually are actually going to die. Uh, there true. are some exceptions where I will wind up killing off a character mm. I didn't expect to, and actually the single most major character I ever killed off was the character of Eon in the Belisarius series. I had not planned on it. Yeah. It came later. But most of them, like the killing of Gretchen Richter's brother Hans in the second of the 1632 books, I figured that out really early on. Um, so, no, because, you know, you're sort of expecting it. And also, i got to be honest, yes, I get really involved in my characters, but, but it's more of an artistic thing than, than a really, I mean, they're not real, 
they're, they're, they're really not. <laughs> I like how he looks at me. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, slightly <laughs> scary girl. They're not. <laughs> depends on, on the character and the situation. Um, I am not as rigid a plotter in terms of which characters will live and die. I tend to do events, like having a convention schedule that you don't know who's going to show up for the panels, and then throw people at the situation and figure out when it's realistic that people will cut out. Uh, I had one character that I genuinely thought, it's a two-character par two pair. I'm killing this one. I'm certain I'm killing this one. All the foreshadowing says I'm killing this one. What? <laughs> and uh, the second character of the pair was like, nope, I'm out. I'm done. Walking away from this book. And I, I literally wrote the chapter where they die unable to see my screen. The typos were monumental. Um, there are typos in, in this particular character's goodbye letter that are in the printed book that are genuine typos. They weren't me putting it on, I couldn't see. And I just kept them. Um, and I, I had no idea that they were gonna go. I had no idea this character was leaving on me uh, before it happened because my subconscious is a dick. <laughs> and I find consistently that when I look back over the work that I have been foreshadowing the thing I didn't think was coming and just haven't been telling myself because I write better when I am writing from an emotionally surprised place. Um, and that is a conscious choice. I don't think that they're real. I, th I know I am telling myself lies, not that the characters are making unexpected choices. Um, and with that particular book, I was a dick. I, I, was, I was a real major dick because I sent the file to my beta readers, ending with that character's goodbye note, just sent the book at that point, day before Thanksgiving with no indication that the book was not in point of fact over. <laughs> and um, if you've read the book in question, it's like 115,000 words long at that point. It's booklet. It could have just been over. Like, goodbye, good night, I'm gonna go write something else. Uh, I got so many phone calls. <laughs> Thanksgiving night, after everyone had finished dinner, they're sitting, oh, I'm gonna read the new installment of Shannon's book and tell her what I think of it. I'm. Oh, I'm going to tell her what I think. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was amazing. I know with mine, when, with the short, st with short stories, I you know, tend to write, with the exception of the, you know, the one torture incident with the coffin, they tend to, you know, I'll be writing and all of a sudden it's like, you know what, this would be a good, you know, this, the way this is going, somebody would probably die in this situation. And I'll look at the situation, okay, well, this is what's happening, who's nearby? <laughs> you know, who's in the area because, well, it's got to be, like Charlie, I want to say, it's got to be believable. You know, and if it's a car wreck, you know, a car comes careening around the corner, but, you know, the person who dies is saying, way the hell over there, <laughs> two blocks away, it doesn't make sense. So I've got to look at the characters, you know, how I've written it already. Okay, well, so this person, this person, this person's here. Well, shit, this is the main character. They're the closest, so logically, they're the ones that get hit. So main character dies, main character dies. It happens. It's kind of like the uh, you know the George R. R. Martin syndrome, really. You know, I mean, the main character is going to die at some point, usually. <laughs> part, just to go back a little bit, part of it is that I don't, I really don't have a very high body count of major characters in my novels. I really, really don't. So what I will do, and I learned this trick from David Weber, is you will develop a secondary or a minor character enough so that readers get an emotional sense it's a real person and then you kill that character off. So it's a very cold-blooded kind of, you know, <laughs> okay, in order to keep my main characters alive, I'm going to create the characters specifically for the purpose of making them, you know, real enough so that readers will have some attachment to them and then bumping that one off. So. That's part of it, is that it is kind of cold-blooded. As yeah. I said, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I have, the most major character ever killed off was on Gwen. Mm -hmm. That was the character beyond. And the reason that happened was that as I got to the fifth book, I had developed them out of one character that David Drake had in his plot, mm -hmm. whom I turned into two characters. And by the time I got to the fifth book, the problem I had was that the other character had gotten more interesting. And if I was going to conclude his story arc, I kind of had to get rid of Eon in order to do it. So it was like, sorry, kid, I hate to do this, but you know, <laughs> you're, you're gone. And I still, in fact, at the last convention I was at two weeks ago, 
a fan came up and, and denounced mm. me for killing off that character. <laughs> I did that 10 years ago. No matter who you kill, they were someone's favorite character. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I do think that we kind of have to be aware yeah. of proportions in our cast. Like, yeah. if you've got a cast that's eight dudes and one girl, mm -hmm. don't kill your girl. Bring in <laughs> two more girls before you kill a girl, because otherwise it, it sends a message that distracts the reader from the story. Um, it's the problem you start seeing on, on procedural shows like NCIS, where we keep cycling through the female field agent to the point that no one wants to get attached to the female field agent anymore, uh, but the guys are always the same. So, right. so we do yeah. have to be aware of the makeup of our cast, and I think that's part of where... Yeah, it is true. I once had a... Uh, this is unrelated to killing, but I once at a convention a few years ago, I had a, a, a fan who's, uh, <laughs> uh, she, she makes jewelry, and mm -hmm. I'd seen her at several times. She's, you know, sort of friend. She came up and she said, Eric, I really like your books, but there's one thing that bothers me. And I said, what is it? She said, where are the queers? She's herself a lesbian. She said, you don't have any gays or lesbians in your store. And I thought about it. It wasn't exactly true. There were, turned out there were a couple, three novels I'd read she just hadn't read. But I thought about it, and I thought, you know, there probably is a shortage. It's not anything I planned. It's just, you know, I didn't think about it. It's what it amounts to. So I made it a point. I said, okay, good point. So I made it a point in the next novel I wrote to put in a couple of major one gay, one lesbian character. And then when I saw her about a year later, I said, do you like it? Said, yeah. <laughs> but that's just one instance. Writers, you tend to not think about things if you don't. I hadn't thought about the example you brought up, but it's true. If you're only going to have one girl or, 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 one guy. or one guy or whatever it is, be conscious of it. Yeah, they need yeah. to have a certain level of plot armor until <laughs> yeah. you bring in more characters that fit into that group. And that's really just because you don't want to seem like you're sending a message you don't mean to. Yeah. Uh, when we set up the, the pseudonym for my zombie novels, mm -hmm. there was some talk from the editorial side of, are you sure you don't want to have a gender neutral or male pseudonym? Because it is easier to sell zombie stories still as a man. Really? That's, yeah, it is. And that's a completely different panel. And I said, no, I can't. They said, why not? I said, well, I kill so many women that if they think it was written by a dude, I look like a total misogynist. <laughs> it's because I have a huge female cast, but I mow through them like wheat. Um, and, and so that actually was a consideration, you know, that if I'm going to kill that many chicks, I need people to know that I am one. What was it? I, oh, I knew that was coming. Um, that was a planned death because I don't think you can go into a zombie situation with a cast of more than one and not lose at least a third of your cast. Um, so in that particular situation with those three characters, we always had the protagonist, the deuteran the deuter protagonist, the secondary protagonist, and the spare. And that was the spare. And um, actually that character was the spare for something that I think leads a lot of us to killing people in that they were too useful. Like that character is explicitly set up and comes up throughout the series when other people are talking about tech problems as a goddamn genius. The things that they could do with tech, no one else in that setting that we have dealt with has been able to do with tech. You've always needed two or three other people to be able to accomplish what that first death could do. And so killing them was necessary because otherwise it's like, well, the CDC has locked down this facility and we're all going to die. I hacked the system. <laughs> How did you hack the system? Magic and rainbows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, it's like the, 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 the most knowledgeable person on Survivor always gets voted off first. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Get rid of them. Yeah. I was, there's one of the Karen Jack book where the, the writer clearly gave this sort of and so all these CEOs got in the building and blew them up in a fire. And you can tell there's a lot of personal anger and fulfillment in that scene. Um, I was wondering, have any of you ever indulged, I really hate this kind of person, I'm going to kill them off. And I'm going to, put, I'm going to write this character specifically as, some, as the kind of person I hate. I'm sure I have. I'm oh, yeah. Sure I, have. I can't keep it up. Um, um, yeah, probably because I've, 
probably done it dozens of times. Army <laughs> lieutenants. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime I introduce an army lieutenant and everything, you just know he's going to die. I, I really, really hate people who don't respect quarantine processes. <laughs> I, I wrote a short story called The Tolling of Pavlov's Bells, which is about an author who wants to wipe out the world with pathogenic viruses and spends like 10 years beforehand writing science fiction novels and doing the convention circuit. <laughs> <laughs> trying to convince everyone that quarantine is unnecessary and for silly little babies and does a very good job. <laughs> and then no one came to my book signing after I put that one out. <laughs> it's not that I hate you, it's that I hate people who don't wash their hands and think that they can come over to my house when they have the flu. <laughs> I don't just because I don't actually have all that many outright villains in my books. Um, I did have one in the Belisarius series and I lovingly kept him alive for five books until I gave him a really gruesome death, but that's actually unusual. Um, so usually when I'm killing, you know, so, um, well the book's out now so it's not a hidden secret, but we pretty well kill off Cardinal Riccio in the last book, and I didn't have any particular animus against him, it's just there were good plot reasons why he had to go for the series as a whole. That's usually why I'm killing somebody off. There's usually something that has to do with the logic of the story. I don't think there's any unconscious hatred on my part of, of really brilliant, unscrupulous, ruthless cardinals that led me to kill him off, I don't know any. Bullies. Hate bullies. <laughs> Every character I've ever killed off has been a bully in one way or another. You know, and not necessarily, you know, just beating up the weaker guy either. I mean, it could be the guy who's like, you're a dork, you know, he's a bully, yeah, he's going to die. <laughs> so, if you, you know, if you ever find any of my short stories, which, you know, some of them are actually still online somewhere, <laughs> you will see that, you know, if you see the guy, he's like, you know, picking on everybody, you know, he's going to die. <laughs> <laughs> and... It's going to be very gruesome and tortured because they are the ones they feel really deserve. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. And it's usually at their victims. Yeah. You first, then you. Do you have a particular death that you are both proud and ashamed of writing? Do you have a particular death that you are both proud and ashamed of writing? Oh, I have to think about that. Um, <laughs> It's the shame part that's hard to yeah. think of. Uh, proud, yeah. <laughs> there are characters I really regret having had to kill, but I've never killed anyone just to kill them. So I, there are things, there are deaths I'm super proud of, but there's nothing that I'm like, oh, I feel so bad yeah, that, 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 yeah. that I did that. I have one death I regret. I can't remember but, um, a, uh, a reviewer get in my head when he said that, that Navarro loves her character so much she doesn't want to kill them off. And then in the next book, I was like, well, I'll show you. I'll kill her. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it worked in the plot. It worked. It wasn't like, okay, I'm just going to like chop the person. But, you know, a book later, I'm like, damn, I wish she was still alive. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, really no. yeah. Right now. I, I have a regret of death that's similar. I wrote a book and uh, turned it in and got notes back from one of the editorial people who was going over it at my publisher that was like, yeah, we, we don't like that this breakup happens and they've just broken up and the character's gone and we need you to kill him. And I, I didn't want to. I was like, but that's not, like, in real life, your ex-boyfriends don't just get hit by a truck as soon as they walk away. <laughs> that's not how it works. You have to deal with them existing in the world. And uh, they really, they wanted the emotional arc of the book to close. And I, I let them convince me. I killed the character because I just didn't feel like having that fight. And it did close the emotional arc of the book in a very good way, but I feel like it did not necessarily feed the emotional arc of the series the way I wanted it to. Uh, so I do regret that death. I, mean, yeah. I mean, actually, the one huge, only really big fight I ever got into with Jim Bain was over. He wanted me to kill a character, and I refused to do it. Did you win? Yeah. I applaud you. Well, I mean, I just, no, there's no way I was going to do it. For one thing, his reasons for wanting me to kill her off were illegitimate. They didn't have anything to do with the story. It had to do with the fact he just didn't like her mm. as a character. And secondly, she was one of the few characters I've ever written that was patterned closely after a real person and be my favorite high school teacher. 
so screw him. And, <laughs> you know, and, and you can't be on a certain point. You have to be practical, but you can't, honestly, you can't let publishers and editors bully you that much. You just can't, even if you lose the sales crook. It's not worth it. So I'm proud of that one, but, uh, and Jim later sort of apologized the way he would do things. Uh, but I'm trying to think if, if one thing, I learned very early on, and this is advice I would give to every aspiring writer, do not read reviews. Just stay the hell away from them because they're gonna piss you off and then you will be tempted to do one of two things. One of them is answer them, which is something you don't ever want to do. It's a losing proposition. Uh, but the other thing, let me put it this way. When I started the Belisario series, my best friend sent me a copy of Robert Graves' Count Belisario. And about a month later, he asked me, he called me up, so he asked me, I read it. And I said, Dave, I uh, actually took the book out in my backyard. I buried it under a pile of garlic. And then I ran horses over the graves. I didn't know where it was. Because I don't want to read what another author did with a character I'm working with. Not because I'm afraid I would copy them, but because I'm afraid I'd go so far out of my way not to copy them that I'd screw up the characterization. The same kind of thing can happen with reviews because you're likely to either do something to prove that the reviewer's wrong, or what can be even worse is to just get cranky and, and, and keep doing something you know is gonna piss off that reviewer just because you really want to piss them off. I particularly strongly urge you to never read a Kirkus review <laughs> because there will bound to be some sarcastic remark in it because I think it's a condition of employment for Kirkus yeah. reviewers. You know, you're right. Because they have to put some snarky remark somewhere in there. So we, you have, we have one minute left according to oh. the guy back there, but I, I just want to add one thing because I hate Stark and Kirk as reviewers. <laughs> he, called, he called the first SEAL Team 666 jingoistic, right? And so after I got done looking up the word to find out what it meant, <laughs> <laughs> I named a major character in the second book, Jingo Jones, and, the, and, the, and that same reviewer didn't, didn't get it. <laughs> Bless. Yes. All right. Um, are there any... Last, I think someone had their hand up, but oh, I... Oh, uh, just yeah. sort of, um, any downsides? You made sense of the story, but when you were doing them, you were thinking to yourself, oh, well, I'm going to get mail for this one. Are you talking to me? I actually got I actually got punched in the chest by Sue Thing last year at Tuscan when I walked in because she read the first chapter of the third SEAL Team book and punched me in the chest. I said, oh, you read it. I really like about those books. I mean, these are very, these guys are very dangerous, but of course they're going to be dying. Well, it wasn't one of the guys, though. I, I wasn't going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> but there have been a couple. I think at this point, every death inspires people sending me grumpy mail. And what's sad is that some of these are the same people that would mail me if I didn't kill anyone, because now it's unrealistic. And yeah, I'm like, yeah, you, you can't actually have your cake <clears throat> and eat it. You have to pick one. Um, I recently wiped a character from existence because they had acted against their essential nature in a way that violated the rules of the universe. Like, they did a thing, and I, I'm writing the thing and going, oh, if the character does the thing, they will never have existed. And they did the thing, and now they're gone. And people are just starting to catch on that the reason they haven't seen this character in a while is because they do not exist, never existed, are gone. And I'm getting some of the most amazing, like, what did you do? <laughs> I, what? You can't do that. I can't sew! <laughs> Rabies for everybody. <laughs> Rabies for you. <laughs> Okay, I think we have reached the end of our time, so yeah. thank you very much. I hope you all enjoyed having fun here. And I really hope you've enjoyed drinking the water here at the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm scared. Come in from you, that's scary. And you have ruined me ever going to Disney World ever again. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hello, I'm Hey guys, Jim here again. 
Just want to let you guys know we're going to be doing a panel at Tucson Comic Con at 5 o'clock on Sunday evening. We're going to go ahead and throw a podcast episode live with the audience and come up with something cool to talk about. And since we're pretty much all going to be together, I was wondering if you guys had any questions that you'd like us to ask each other in a public setting, do a bit of a round table. So if you guys have any questions you'd like to send to us, go ahead and shoot me an email at creativeplaypodcastnet at gmail.com. That's creativeplaypodcastnet at gmail.com. All right, guys. And always, thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to the Creative Play and Podcast Network. And feel free to enjoy our other shows, such as D&D Journey of the Fifth Edition and Scion Ragnarok and Roll, a Scion hero to Ragnarok story. Thank you for listening. It's an awesome book. I love the Oh Rats Rats, 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 yeah. Rats. Oh my god, the, the series actually. And you can anywhere, but uh thank you so much. Can I get a picture?